morning, everybody. Good to see you all here today. I'm Pastor Chris, one of the pastors here at Foothill Church, and we're delighted uh, that you came to join us today. Grab your Bibles. Let's go to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. We're going to look at just three verses today. And while you're turning there, let me just... Um, let, let me just remind you of a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, as we look into the book of Mark and we talk about Jesus, it's, it's pretty plain that today Jesus is popular, right? I mean, as of Wednesday, I noticed that Jesus had over 4.8 million friends on Facebook and 500 followers on Twitter. So he's pretty popular, and I meet very few people who actually say, I don't like Jesus, right? Even people from different religions, there's something uh, that people love about Jesus. And yet, if you talk to people about who is Jesus, like how would you describe him, you you come to realize very quickly that uh, we're talking about two very different, three very different, 10, 20 very different people, right? Because most of what people do is they take and they co-op Jesus, and I like Jesus that looks like me and acts like me and approves of what I do and all that, and, and, and so we end up with a Jesus that, that's very similar, oddly enough, right, to ourselves, right? Jesus never pushes back on me. Jesus never uh, doesn't approve of me. He's just loving and kind and all that, and and now this isn't new. This is, this is as old as the Bible, uh, uh, as old as Jesus coming to earth, because, and this is why we have four Gospels. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, because part of what they're doing is saying, look, uh, people in the first century began to co-opt Jesus for their own purposes, say this is what he liked, he's like. I mean, whether or not the little Jesus has a wife fragment is real, that's a classic example of it, that, that uh, we, we want to think of Jesus in this way or that way. We, well, I'm not saying that Jesus had a wife. I'm saying whether or not that's an actual true fragment is a, is a different issue. So, so the gospel writers sit down and write the gospels so that we have an accurate picture of who Jesus really is not, not always who we just want him to be, um, because uh, there, there's a problem with, with making Jesus in our image, with wanting him to be just like us, and, and the problem is this, he, that Jesus can't change you. In fact, he's, he's powerless, he's really nice, he just has no power. He can't transform you. He can't push back on you. He can't challenge you. And I don't think most people, that's the Jesus they really want. I think most people say, no, I want to be changed. I see there's, there's things in my life I don't like. There's, there's things I hate about myself and, and I wish were different. And, and as try as you might, as many books as you read, Jesus is the one who can transform you. He can push against you. He can, and, and so you need the real Jesus. You need a Jesus powerful enough to save you. And that's the Jesus of Scripture. So Mark and the other gospel writers sit down and go, look, we're going to set the record straight. We're going to tell you who he is, what he said, what he did. And we can say this because we know, because we saw him. We watched him. We walked with him. We knew him. Okay? And so that's what they do. And now, now today, Jesus, in these three verses, is going to pull back the curtain a little bit. Because we said the whole book of Mark is about what? It's about who is this man? Who, who is this Jesus guy? And Jesus is going to pull back a little bit and in a very subtle way remind us of, of who he is. And, and, and he's going to teach us some important things, things that I think will, will transform you if you'll let them, that, that will push against you, that will encourage you, I hope. Um, and so, so okay, so let's, let's kind of set the stage now of where we are in Mark chapter 12. Uh, remember that Jesus came into Jerusalem back in chapter 11 and it's the last week of his life. He has, he has a week to go, okay? And, uh, and, and he comes to the center of Israel's worship, which is very significant, because he's going to replace the center. He's going to become the center of worship. And he goes to the temple, and from all we can tell, starting in chapter 11, verse 27, all the way to the end of chapter 13, this is one day in Jesus' life. One day. And what a day. Uh, it, it, it is. Um, from the, the moment, if you look at chapter 11, verse 27, he comes again to Jerusalem. He's walking in the temple, and boom, immediately there's confrontation. And it's one question after another, right? So we've walked the last several weeks. We've been walking through these questions and the things that people have asked him, and they're trying to trap him. So, you know, he, he's been asked about his authority, his credentials. Who gave you this authority? Why are you here? And he's been asked about politics and government. He's, he's been asked about theology and scripture. Last week, he, he was asked by a scribe about, you know, which commandment is greater, a legal question about the word of God. 
And Mark 12, 34 says, after all that, no one dared ask him any more questions. These, these scribes, these teachers, these Pharisees realize we're getting nowhere with this one-on-one -on -one confrontation trying to trap him. So we've got to come up with a different tack. And so now you're going to see they're going to try to murder him. They're going to try to trap him. They're going to try to destroy him. So now it's Jesus' turn, starting in verse 35, where we're going to get today. It's Jesus Jesus has won the field. Jesus takes the field. Jesus goes, all right, it's my turn. I get to start talking about what I want to talk, to, talk about without interruption. This isn't just me answering questions now. Now I'm going to tell you some things. Now I want you to think about that with me, okay? Here Jesus, it, maybe it's, it, it's probably Tuesday, okay? Jesus is going to be murdered on Friday. He's got about 72 hours left. <laughs> okay, set you you got 72 hours left in your life, which means he's only got a few more things he can teach people before he's gone. Um, and, and he cannot teach anymore, at least this side of the resurrection. Nobody knows he's going to be resurrected yet. So, so now, if, if you're Jesus and you realize, I got, I got 72 hours left, I got a few sermons left that I got to give to people, uh, I, then, then, then what do you say? Because look, at, I, I think it's safe to assume that if you know your time is coming, you're going to teach what you consider to be big, important lessons in these last hours, right? I mean, if, if I knew that I was going to die this Friday, you know, I'd be gathering my kids around me. Okay, I want to remind you, here's some things I want you to know before daddy's gone, right? If, 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 I was a, if I'm a pastor and I, I knew that in three weeks I was going to be gone from Foothill Church, I think I'd, I'd say, okay, I'm, there's certain things I want to leave with you bef before I go. I think it's safe to assume that these are when the most important lessons come out. And... and and so that's the scene, and Jesus is going to start teaching some of the most important lessons of his life. And now watch this. Let's, let's read together, starting in chapter 12, verse 35, and let's see what he does. What's, what's the first lesson he's going to teach him? Okay, verse 35. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls himself Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Now, how does that strike you? <laughs> like, like, what? It sounds like he, he went back and he quoted Psalm 110, and then he explains Hey, you guys have this understanding of Psalm 110. You know, I want to give you kind of this different idea. Let me ask a question, kind of punch some holes in your thinking of that. It sounds, truthfully, it sounds very academic. So I think it's kind of like this trivia thing with them. Like, you know, uh, what do you think this means? Well, I'll tell you. I'm going to tell you something else about it. And, and, and I, think, I think, truthfully, if we're being honest, I've read this passage I don't know how many times. How many of you have read this passage before? Just go ahead and read it. You don't have to be embarrassed if you haven't. Okay, a lot of you have read it. And I'm guessing... <laughs> That, um, that, that, that you read it and, and it kind of was like, oh, okay, move on. I don't see any, I don't, I don't have any idea what's happening here, right? This is just, just I'm gonna, I got to move on to something that actually makes sense to me. So you, you keep going. I mean, this, it feels very, very academic. And so it's, you know, it's like a dad, you know, I'm dying. Come, I want to talk to you children. Uh, everybody come around me. Now, here we go. Uh, if you ever face a right triangle, then you need to know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? <laughs> Like, and your kids are like, why is that so important, right? Okay, it, it feels, I mean, this doesn't feel very important. It feels kind of like Jesus whiffed. Like, like he, 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 you had this great opportunity, Jesus, and, and this doesn't feel very relevant. But apparently that's not how people felt, because look at the last verse. They heard him gladly. There's something about this that actually fascinates them. They're like, wow, we never Oh, it makes them happy. Jesus is teaching them something. Now, be careful. I don't think that the great throng hearing him gladly means that the great throng were also following him. I think there's a lot of people that hear Jesus gladly, right? Oh, I love Jesus' teaching. Jesus is moral. Jesus is good. Jesus does. I mean, we love, I, I don't follow him, but, but I think he's, I'll hear him gladly. Okay, so what are they learning? What is Jesus teaching them? What, why is this so fascinating to them? What, what caught their attention? Uh, what is it about these three verses that should catch our attention? 
and not just sort of skim over it and go, well, that, that didn't feel very relevant. Why did Jesus use this as his first sermon to pull back the curtain a little bit? Okay, well, let me, let me just, I first want to kind of teach you, I want, I want to give you a point sort of about the context, and then we're going to start to narrow it in, and I'm going to spend most of our time on really what, what the meat of what's happening here. The first thing I want you to see, I think what Jesus, what Mark is showing us in organizing it this way, is that Jesus wants you to know something about, about, uh, about knowing him. Here's what I mean by that. There's been question after question after question, right? And, and there's all these questions, and some are you know, disingenuous. We're just trying to trap you. Some are honest. Jesus answers them. And sometimes when he does, he's like, I'm not playing your game with you. But the point of the book of Mark is what? Who is Jesus? How do we arrive at that answer? Okay, I think part of what Mark is doing in organizing it this way is, is to say questions, our questions will only get us so far. We can't know who Jesus is just by simply asking questions. See, it doesn't mean Jesus is afraid of questions, and I I don't want to deal with that. I I think when they come from an honest seeker, but at the end of the day, even the most honest question, the most ingenious question we can come up with is not enough to reveal Jesus. And so, so a human agenda can't reveal or obscure him. It can't prove or disprove him. Jesus has to open his mouth and say, you need to know certain things. And your questions will never get you to ask this kind of thing of me. In other words, unless Jesus takes command, we don't get the full truth. See, see, like the Bible makes clear that we cannot know God apart from God revealing himself. That we can only know so much. We can look around and go, well, there's a pine tree and there's a dolphin and there's a whale. And wow, you know, we, something did this. Something is out there. But, but we need more than that. And if God chose to hide himself, we'd never find him. But God revealed himself. He revealed himself in the word of God. He revealed himself in his son most magnificently. So, I mean, you can think of it this way. If you drew a line and an arrow going like this, everything below the line is what God has chosen to reveal about himself. Everything above the line, which is infinite, is all we don't know about God. And we don't know a lot, right? The Bible is is God saying, here's what you need to know. There's a lot. I mean, Deuteronomy 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord. There's all kinds of things that God doesn't tell us. Okay, so, 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 so one of the reasons Jesus has to say, I got to start talking, I got I to set the agenda here, is because you won't find me. You, you won't understand who I am apart from me doing this. I think this is one of the reasons, by the way, to help you kind of put it in context. Last week when he says to the scribe, you're not far from the kingdom of God, right? You're, you're close, but you're not in. Is because the way you, you get there is not on your own, not through your own questions. The ultimate truth I've got to reveal about myself. Now, some of you have questions about Jesus, so some of you, 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 you know, you, you've got, and, and good questions. That's great. It's just not enough. You can ask questions all the time, all day long, your entire life, but, but um, and you can get all of them answered, a reasonable explanation, but Jesus still needs to reveal himself to you because the truth of the matter is we don't know what we need to know. Jesus has to reveal it to us. So one of the greatest prayers you can pray is, Jesus, show me who you really are. I want to know you. I want to know know you for who you say you are. I think God loves to answer that prayer. Okay, so so he gets to the end, and, and, and now after a day of questions comes what somebody has said, the question of the day. And this is massively important. Now, now let's watch. The second thing I want you to see is, uh, is, is Jesus is going to teach us something about Scripture. Now, now, read with me here, verse 35. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? So he's talking to scribes. They're saying that Christ will be the son of David. Jesus then quotes something. And, and here he says, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared. Okay, now stop there. Because that's, that's easy to skip over. And if you do, you're going to miss something massively important. He says, David 
in his, it, it, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared. So what, what's Jesus doing? He's doing a couple of things here. Number one, he's affirming the authority of Scripture. And Jesus is going to do this. This isn't the only place he does it. But he quotes Psalm 110. By the way, the most quoted um, uh, psalm, the most quoted Old Testament text in the entire New Testament. I think it's quoted or referred to over 33 times. Um, and, and, and he quotes Psalm, psalm 110, okay? And, uh, and, and, and he takes them back and says, look, the whole foundation of my argument, I want you to see, is Psalm 110. I believe David spoke this by the Holy Spirit. I see Scripture as authoritative, okay? Second thing, though, I think that he tells us when he says in the Holy Spirit is he affirms the inspiration. What's the inspiration of Scripture? Do we mean Scripture is inspired? Like, wow, the Beatles were inspired. That's not what we mean at all. Inspired means breath. It means, it means it comes out of. And so when we say it's inspired, we're saying God breathed out the text and men wrote it down. Okay? Peter says men moved by the Holy Spirit okay, wrote Scripture. Okay? So, so, so this is how it happens. In other words, De- uh, Jesus looks back. He sees David's words in Psalm 110 and says they're the Holy Spirit's words. The Holy Spirit spoke these words, David wrote them down. How that happened, we don't know. But Jesus believes this. He really believes that Scripture is authoritative and inspired. And this is what we believe as Christians. We believe that all the words in Scripture are God's words in such a way that to disbelieve anything that your Bible teaches or disobey anything that the Bible says we should or shouldn't do is to disbelieve and disobey God himself. These are God's words. And so we believe them. We obey them. Do we do it perfectly? No. We strive over a lifetime to obey what we're learning in this. Okay? So, so okay, that, that, that's, he, he affirms, he, he, he teaches us something about knowing himself. He teaches us something about Scripture. But let me, let me kind of camp on this last part. This is really what I want you to see here. The last thing I want you to see is that Jesus wants you to know something about himself. Now watch what he does here. David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Okay, now. So I told you, Jesus is quoting from Psalm 110. Let me show you that quote in Psalm 110, because I think this will help you understand a little bit of what's happening. Turn back with me to Psalm 110. If you're looking at the Bibles next to your chairs, it's on page uh, 509. Uh, and, and let's just, we're just going to look at the first verse here so you can, you can see what's, what's happening. <clears throat> okay, now, now look at it. If, and, and I hope... You have a translation that shows you this. If you're reading the ESV like I am, I think the NIV does the same thing, NASB. But, uh, but, but look, at, look at verse 1. It says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So this is a quote. But notice what's different. And this is kind of a little bit academic, but please follow me here because you, this is helpful for you. Okay, notice that that first, the Lord, Lord is... All caps and small caps, right? If it should show up in your translations as a, as, a, as a capital and then lower caps, okay? And then says to my Lord, which is just capital and small case. Now, what's, why did they do it this way? What does this mean? Well, well, when you see the all caps and lower caps, that is the translator's way of signifying to you that they're translating the word Yahweh, Jehovah. Okay, that's, that's what they're doing. That's always, it's the covenant name of God. Okay, Yahweh. So he says, and then that other one, Lord, is the word Adonai. Just means Lord. And so, so, so he's saying, Yahweh said to Adonai. And so Jesus, if you go back to Mark chapter 12, is saying, how can they say that Yahweh, sa- how can David say, uh, Yahweh said to Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. I mean, David calls him Lord, so how is he just his son? Now, now go back to Mark 12. By the time Jesus comes on the scene, Psalm 110 is, 
universally recognized as what's called a messianic psalm. It's looking forward to the time when the Messiah will come and what that reign will be like. God will, God will put his enemies under, under his, his feet. That was a common Semitic idea of a, you know, a vanquished enemy would come and the king would literally symbolically put his foot on the neck of the enemy saying, I've completely, you're under my subjection. And God is saying, and so G, G, Jesus is saying, look, David said to God that God said to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet. And so he's saying, how's this possible? How's it possible that the Messiah can be both David's son and his Lord? How's it possible? They're one person, and that person is Jesus. So, so the common understanding of the day was this. The Messiah will be this great king who will be the son of David. He'll be, let's say it this way, he'll be a man. And Je Jesus is saying, okay, um, but he's more. He's more than a man. And that's really what I want you to see here. He's a king, he's a man, but he's more. And so if you, again, follow this up in context, what's happening? He just said to the, to the scribe last week, he said, look, um, uh, you're, you're not far, but you're not in. And the way across the threshold, the way from the porch into the living room is that you recognize the full truth of who I am. Because, Mr. Scribe, you only see me as a man right now. You got to see me as more than that. The Messiah if that's who I really am, is more than just the son of David. Now, but I think this is what Jesus wants to see. I think he's revealing something about himself. So let's talk about that. First of all, he's saying he is the human son of David. So, so one of the things we affirm as Christians is we say that Jesus Christ is 100% man. He's a man. He really was a, a, and is a, a man. Now, now, and he's the son of David. He's the promised Messiah that would come through that line. Now, this would have been very easy to verify in Jesus' day. Go to the temple, you'd look up the records, and you'd be able to find out, in fact, that's exactly what the book of Luke and the book of Matthew do. They trace the genealogy of Jesus to show Jesus. Jesus is the son of David. He is the rightful heir to the throne. Okay? Uh, and, and, and most people in Jesus' day had no problem going, the Messiah who comes will be the son of David. Some people saw Jesus as that son of David. So you've got blind Bartimaeus in chapter 10, verse 47, saying, you know, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You've got the woman, the Canaanite woman, outside of the Jewish people, Matthew 15, same thing. Jesus, have mercy on me, son of David. Uh, you've got him riding into town on a donkey, right? And the people throw down the palm branch. They say, Hosanna to the son of David. What are they saying? We see you, in some respect, as the fulfillment of Psalm 110, as the fulfillment of this, this son of David who's going to come and, and reign. So look at it, 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 it. Jesus was fully human. He's not disputing that here. He, he ate. If you have a problem with that, you've got to understand. Jesus ate. He drank. He slept. He wept. He got hungry. He felt pain. He, he cried. Uh, he, he, he bled real drops of blood. He had a torso that could be pierced with a spear. He had hands that could be pierced with nails and feet that could be pierced with nails. He touched people. They touched him. There's no, there's incontrovertible evidence in Scripture that Jesus was a man. And to deny the doctrine of Jesus' humanity is to deny something at the heart of Christianity. You take away his humanity, you take away Christianity. And I want to show you that. Let me give you some reasons why his humanity is absolutely essential and ought to be a massive encouragement to you. Okay? Okay. Let's go, and I'm just going to show you, we're going to get real nimble here with our Bibles. So go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. It's on page 942. And look at, look at what Paul says in Romans. Look at verses 18 and 19. Here's the first reason Jesus had to be a man. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men... 
So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. That's Adam. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made sinners. Righteous. You see what he just said? Here's the first reason. That because Jesus had to be fully human, because only a man could be our representative and, and, uh, and obey in our place. So his perfect righteousness brings, right, we, we, are, we can now have our right, his righteousness applied to us. So verse 19, right? So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This is, what Christ, this is what his humanity does for me. His humanity is, is he, he dies, he, his one act of righteousness makes me righteous. You cannot be righteous apart from this. Righteous in God's eyes. You may be good, you may be moral, but you need the righteousness of Jesus for God to see that righteousness and apply it to you. Okay, the second of all is it because only a man could die in our place and pay our penalty. Go over to Hebrews chapter 2. It's toward the end of your Bible, and we're going to come back to Hebrews in a minute, but it's on page 1002 if you're needing that. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verses uh, 16 and 17. Now, listen to what Paul, so he, he had to be a man to die in our place and pay our penalty. Listen to how Paul says this. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Paul just said, he's not after saving angels. He's not after spirits. He's after people like us, the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He had to. You see how he phrased that? There was no choice the matter. He had to be like his brothers in every way because God wasn't interested in saving angels. God was interested in saving men. And unless Christ was a man, he couldn't die for your sin. And if Christ isn't fully human, then you are still in your sins and so am I. So because, because only a man could die in our place and pay our penalty. You see this? This is a wonderful truth. That Jesus became a man, why? To take the form of a servant, to empty himself, to, to give his life as a ransom so that you and I could have salvation. Number three, because only a man could fill the role of mediator. Go back just a few pages to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're studying this in our men's group on Wednesday, and listen to what this says. For there is, there is one God... And there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You see how Paul makes a point? Not just Christ Jesus, the man, Christ Jesus. And there's only one that can, you know, what's a mediator? Why do, you know, conflicting parties hire a mediator? The mediator steps in between the parties to try and bring them together. That's Jesus. And, and there's no other person on planet earth that can do this. You understand this? There's no other man that God's going to accept and say, okay, yeah, you can be our go-between. This, there, is, there is one mediator, just one. So this means I am not a mediator. Pastors are not mediators. This means priests are not mediators. This means saints are are not mediators. Bishops and popes are not mediators. Ancestors are idols. Mary is not a mediator. There is one mediator, the man, Christ Jesus. That's it. This is why we don't pray to saints. This is why we don't pray to Mary. Because that's going nowhere. And it's nowhere in Scripture. There's one mediator that I cry out to and say, save me. And it's Jesus and Jesus alone. And if you pray or you go to anything else, that's not salvation. You need Jesus to fill that role. You see this? This is why he had to be a man. Well, there's other reasons. To be, I think he had to be a man to be our example. Go over, you're in Timothy. Go over to uh, to 1 John. Or actually, let's go to to 1 uh, Peter 2.21. It's on page 1015. 
See, we had to have a man to be our example and our pattern in life. So, so 1 Peter 2, verse, uh, verse 21 For to this you have been called, because Christ Jesus also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Why did he leave us an example? So that you might follow in his steps. Okay, there's, you can go to the first John passage, see the same thing. This idea of we walk the way he walked. He lived, he died as a man, and so we look and say, that's our ultimate example. Will we ever arrive? Never. Will we ever do it exactly like Jesus? No. But he's our example. He's our pattern. He's what we follow. So the goal of the Christian life, part of our goal is to live, to die like Jesus lived. Right? Unfailing devotion to God. It doesn't mean we have to be crucified. There's one death that we look to. It means I live and I die in obedience to God like I saw in Christ. Okay? Jesus demonstrated that for us. We needed a man. If he, was just, if he was just fully divine, if he was a spirit floating around, how does that help me? How does that? I can't ever. I mean, you, 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 you didn't, a, a spirit doesn't live with the same temptations. You don't live in this falling body. You, you don't know what, what it feels like to be a human being. I can't follow your example because I can't even relate to you, which is probably the greatest truth that I want to show you, and that's this. He had to be a man to be a sympathetic high priest. So go back, you're in Peter, just go back a few books, you'll get to Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter two again, page 1002, and and look at what it says. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those of us who are being tempted. You hear what the writer of Hebrews is saying? He's tempted like you. He, he knows he lived in a fallen body. He, he, you know, he, he had, this, he had this, this understanding of what it means to have flesh and bones and temptations and, and sins coming at him even though he never sinned. We'll see here in a second. Look at, look at chapter four, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect, every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You, you see how he can relate to you? Did sexual temptation come Jesus' way? Yes. Did greed and the temptation be greed? Yes. Any temptation, all those temptations came to him and he said no and he did it without sin. Temptation isn't a sin. And Jesus goes, I know what that feels like. But keep reading. Let us then, verse 16, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Why? That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, we can, we can now go because we got this great high priest who, who is now, he, he represents us. He knows what it's be, to be like us. He wasn't just some, you know, cape flapping the wind, floating above the ground, you know, shoot him and, you know, things would pass through him. He, he, he felt our pain in a real way. He's a sympathetic high priest. This is, this is one of the most profound truths of Scripture. Listen to what Tim Keller says. He says, Christianity alone among the world religions claims that God became uniquely and fully human in Jesus Christ and therefore knows firsthand despair, rejection, loneliness, poverty, bereavement, torture, imprisonment on the cross He went beyond even the worst human suffering and experienced cosmic rejection and pain that exceeds ours as infinitely as his knowledge and power exceed ours. In his death, God suffers in love, identifying with the abandoned and God-forsaken. Why did he do it? The Bible says that Jesus came on a rescue mission for creation. He had to pay for our sins so that someday he can end evil and suffering without ending us. This is Jesus. You see why his humanity is so vitally important. So that means, look, some of you are going through, you'd say, man, I feel like I'm 
I'm going through hell right now. I just talked to a family afterwards. They're like, we can't bear it anymore. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how we, I mean, I can't, I'm so tired and I've got all these things. What do I do? And the answer is, look at, I don't have this easy answer. I say, Jesus is the sympathetic high priest. He says, I know, I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to be rejected. I know what it feels like to be exhausted beyond anything you can imagine. I'm with you in the trench. This is amazing. Jesus sympathizes with you. He, he knows what it means. There's no suffering that you can go through that you say, you know, Jesus, God, you, you can't relate to this. Oh, yeah, I can. Now, you see how important this is? I think most people, you go, hey, do you think Jesus was a man? Yeah, of course, he's a man. But I don't know that very many of us really just go, oh, my goodness, how important it was that he was a man. I wouldn't be a Christian without his humanity. Now, let's go back to Mark chapter 12. Because again, I, I think he's saying, you know, the Lord said to my Lord. So David calls him, 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 himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? Okay, so Jesus isn't saying, look, he, he's not a man. He's saying he's more than a man. Your common understanding, Israel, in this day, is that all this means, you know, you, you understand he's going to be the son of David. Why then does, da why didn't, does David call this Messiah Lord? Ah, don't you see? He's more. That's what he's doing. And so he's not just saying, look, I am, Jesus isn't saying that this Messiah is, the, is just the, the human son of David. He's, he's saying he's the divine Lord. So, so we affirm as Christians that Jesus is 100% human and 100% divine. Not half and half. You don't split them out. You don't cut them open and lights come out. You know, he's all God, all man, all the time. How's that possible, Chris? I have no idea. The Bible doesn't explain it. I told you. There's mysteries. There's secret things. There's things revealed. We see it. See, Jesus is God. In the beginning, John says, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. I mean, the Bible is unapologetic about telling you this is true and then not explaining it. I mean, Mark said in the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus ran into demons that confessed, Jesus, we know who you are, Jesus, Son of God. Peter affirmed it in chapter 8, verse 29. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is going to come out in front of Pilate and say, I'm the Son of God. A Roman centurion is going to stand at the foot of the cross after nailing Jesus up there and stand back and the earth is going to shake. And he's going to look and say, surely this man was the Son of God. You see this? There's, there's, no, there, there's no hiding the fact that, that Jesus sees himself and that the Bible sees him as God. And the book of Mark is filled with miracle after miracle that shows Jesus' full divinity. And Jesus shared attributes with God. Do you understand this? Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father in heaven. And uh, Paul says that he's the image of the invisible God. He says, in him, the fullness of God dwells bodily. You understand? So, sometimes we talk in Christianity about, about the, the, um, the, the attributes of God that are peculiar to God. And what do we, they're, they're the omnis. You've heard these before? God is omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. All-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at once. And do you understand that all of those things are true of Jesus? Jesus is omnipotent. The Bible, the book of Mark, shows us he's the creator. He's the controller of the heavens and the earth. He's the calmer of storms. He's the provider of food. He's the healer of the sick. He's the raiser of the dead. He's the forgiver of sins. He's the giver of eternal life. And he is the judge of all men and angels. Do you see this? He's omnipotent. Now, what are you going through that you feel like you can't trust Jesus with? He's all-powerful. There is no addiction, there is no life circumstance that you cannot trust Jesus with. Do I need to change mics back there, Shane? Am I good? Oh, good. Okay, so he's omnipotent. You see this? He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He told his disciples in Matthew 18, verse 20, he says, look, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there with them. 
How's that possible? Because two are over here and two over there and two over in Egypt and some are, you know, in Central Europe. And, and he says, I'm there with you. I'm omnipresent. He tells his disciples one of his last words, remember? He says, go and make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, and, and behold, I'm with you even to the end of the age. I'm with you. And the Bible talks about the omnipresence of God. Psalm 139, David writes this incredible psalm where he says, where can I go from your, where can I flee from you? If I, if I go to heaven, you're there. If I go to hell, you're there. If I rise up on the wings of the dawn, you're there. There is nowhere. Now, now listen, that's not supposed to scare you. That's supposed to comfort you. Like this family today, we're, we feel like we're in hell. And he's there. He's with you. There's nowhere that you can flee. There's nowhere you can go that God isn't with you. See, some of you are going through really tough times. Does God even know? Does God care? He's with you. Jesus is with you. If you know him. He's, he's, he's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. But he's also omniscient. He knows everything. I mean, the Bible tells us he knew what was people's, uh, people's thoughts. He knew what his enemies were thinking. At one point, we're told that, look, you didn't need to tell Jesus about people because the Bible says he knew what was in man. Now think about that. He knows me. You know, I think one of our deepest longings is to know and be known. And we long for that friend that says, I know everything about you and I still love you. And I bet there's nobody that knows everything about you because you're afraid. I am. Does Michelle know everything about me? She knows as much as any other human being, but does she know, does she know that sometimes my mind goes to places it shouldn't go? Does she know about the black, blackness of my heart? Is it any wonder that Paul says, I'm the worst of sinners? Like, when I survey the territory, the only, only heart I know is mine, and it's the blackest heart I know. And Jesus knows it and still loves you. Wow. Wow. You see how glorious this is? But this is the Jesus. This is, this is Jesus. So, so, so why, why should you care about this? I mean, other than these things we've talked about, why is, it, why is it that we need to know that Jesus is fully human and fully divine? I mean, isn't it good enough that we just believe he's a good man? No. In fact, it's nonsense to believe he's just a good man. Like C.S. Lewis says, he, he can't possibly just be a good man because a good man doesn't say things like Jesus says. A good man doesn't walk around going, I'm God. <laughs> right? If I said to you, hey, everybody, welcome to Foothill Church, I'm God. <laughs> right? You'd be like, that guy's crazy. And he's going to start some cult and they're going to burn him down. Right? I mean, it's going to be, people are going to kill themselves. I mean, that, that's crazy. He's not just a good man. He can't, he's, as C.S. Lewis says, he's a liar, right? He's a lunatic, or he really is the Lord. That's their only three choices. See, see, there are profound reasons, Jesus. He had, the Bible says, he had to be God. He had to be fully divine. Let me give you just a couple of them. Why did he have to be divine? Because the only one who, who, who he, only someone who is God could bear the full weight of our sin. Okay, let me, let, me, let me tell you what the Bible says. God doesn't sweep any sin under the carpet and say, I'll just act like that didn't happen. Ever. Every sin that was ever committed by you, by me, by everybody in the world will be paid for in one of two ways either by Christ and what he did on the cross or by you and me eternally because our sins aren't covered by that. Those are your only choices. 
every sin will be paid for. And the only one that could bear the weight, the crushing weight of the sins of the entire world is God. No human could do that. It's, it's absolutely, I mean, this is just a mind-blowing thing that God does. Every, every sin, past, present, and future of mine, of everybody in this room, of everybody in Los Angeles, and everybody in America, and everybody around the world, and everybody of all history, he puts them on his shoulders, he takes them, and he pays for them. So you, you find refuge either in what he did, or you pay for them the rest of all eternity. Only God could do that. But second of all, real simply, the Bible teaches very plainly that salvation is from the Lord, period. There is no, no human being, you understand this? No human being saves another human being. You didn't save yourself. I don't save you. A pastor doesn't save you. A priest doesn't save you. Uh, no one's Jesus alone. God alone saves you. Salvation, Jonah 2.9 says, salvation belongs to the Lord. And that means if salvation is going to happen, God must do it. Or, or, or it doesn't happen. Jesus had to be God. See, so, so, so if Jesus is not fully God, then I have no salvation. If he's not full divinity, full humanity, I have no Christianity. I'm not a Christian. What it means is my sins were laid upon a mere human and they weren't paid for. They crushed him. He died, and that was it. But he didn't, did he? He rose to prove this is all true, and I'm God, and I'm vindicated, and you're justified if you'll run to me. See, now do you see why Jesus says, I gotta pull back subtly this curtain. This is the first thing I wanna see, want you to teach because, because Jesus is asking the question of the day. Who is the Christ? Is he merely the son of David? Or is he more than that, the son of God? Not either or, both and. And if you answer he's merely one or the other, then I think you're with the scribe. Back in chapter 12, verses 28 to 34, and Jesus would say to you, okay, you're close, but you're not in. You got to understand who I am. But if you say more, oh no, he's, he's fully human, fully divine. I embrace that. I believe it. Then as Paul says, he says, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's his divinity, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, who gets raised from the dead? People, human beings. Raised, so there's his humanity. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. What's Paul saying? In other words, this isn't just, hey, just confess something. Anybody want to be a Christian here? Oh, yeah, I do. Just confess this and you're good. That's not what Paul's saying at all. It's confession that percolates out of the heart because hearts believe and mouths confess what's in the heart. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, so I can't help speaking about what my heart is filled with. I mean, look, if I saw a great movie yesterday. I'm just, oh, this is awesome. My heart is filled. I'm going to tell you about it. I had some great experience. I'm going to tell you about it. It's going to come. It's going to come out of my mouth. See, Paul is not saying that mere confession disconnected from the heart will save you. And by the way, I think this is maybe something that inadvertently modern evangelicalism wants us to believe. That if you just said a prayer, you walked an aisle, whatever, that's good enough. It's a pathway to salvation is Christ collides with my heart and it explodes out of my mouth and I go, Jesus, I believe this. I really believe Jesus is Lord. God raised him from the dead. This takes care of my sin. I am justified in God's eyes. That saves you. So, so are you beginning to see why Jesus has to start here? Because, because he just told a man, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're, you're not in. You're close, but you're not in. Because you need to see me for who I, the fullness of who I am. So you need me to be the son of David. Yes, you do. But you need me 
to be the son of God. Yes, you do. So is that you? Do you believe this? Not, not, not yeah, yeah I, I, I intellectually assent to that. Do you believe it? Because if you believe it, it'll change everything. I mean, everything. <laughs> That's a whole other sermon. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that you were not merely a man and you were not merely divine. You were the God man. You were the one who came, the only one who could be our mediator, the only one who could die in our place, the only one who could actually take the sins of the world upon you. And we praise you for that, God. And Lord, I pray for people here this morning that, Father, they need to know this Jesus. Maybe they affirmed it intellectually. Maybe like we talked about last week, they're standing on the porch, but they're not in. God, I pray, move people. Move them from sort of this, I'm halfway there because I see one or the other. God, open eyes to see who Jesus really is. That they would run to you, Jesus. They would step inside, be part of your kingdom. Because as you've pulled back the veil this morning, God, I pray there'd be, there'd be people here this morning that say, I had that aha moment where God, God touched my heart. God showed me who he really was, drew me to himself, and I was saved. I pray for people that are here this morning, God. They just needed to come to know there's a God in control. Their hearts are hurting and they feel overwhelmed and to hear that Christ is omnipotent and Christ is omnipresent he's with us Lord I thank you for that Emmanuel God with us he didn't just come to walk with us God you're, you're with us now you, you'll be with us when we walk out of here if we know you and so I pray, God, for those that do know you that, that are looking for that and saying, man, does Jesus know what I'm going through? Does he know I'm in this valley right now? God, comfort their hearts with that truth, I pray. We love you, we thank you, we praise you, God, for all you've done. And we ask this through your Son, by your Spirit. And in Jesus' name.